What up, everybody? Today, I'm going to run you through a nutrition masterclass because these are the FAQs or just where a lot of people struggle when they initially come on board for coaching. So we're going to fly through this. If you need to pause it, take notes or message me on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, just let me know. This is nutrition, which is part one. There is also going to be a part two, which is all about mindset, which we will touch on a little bit later in this one. So where to start? Nutrition basics, what are macros, why do they matter, how yo-yo diets work and how to avoid them, and then weekend dieting. So metabolism. People believe that they either have a fast or slow metabolism, which genetics does have an influence on, but there are actually five components that go into making up your metabolism. Basal metabolic rate, resting metabolic rate, thermic effect of food, exercise activity, and non-exercise activity thermogenesis, with their abbreviations all right there for you. Um, genetics will 100% play a part in the first two, BMR, RMR, uh, but you still have three other effects that make up your metabolism on a daily basis that you can have an influence over. BMR is the minimum level of energy we need to maintain the vital functions of the body. So imagine you're asleep, you haven't eaten in a while, you're breathing, heart is beating, cells are doing the bare minimum to keep you alive, you're not digesting, moving, doing anything. That's your BMR. You're essentially a log with organs. Uh, the number of calories, energy needed to keep us functioning at a base level minimum to be that log with organs. Uh, the recommended minimum intake of calories is 1200 because the approximate average of a BMR of an average female is 1400 calories. So if you think about the amount of times that you've done a meal plan and they've been 1200 calories, that is quite literally the definition of like one calorie away from being the definition of starvation. So that's probably why you've lost a lot of weight in the past. And then you've just gone back to doing exactly what you're doing because you are quite literally not eating enough calories to keep your organs living. And these are all general numbers. All this information is going to be 100% general and averaged as opposed to me helping you individually. If you want to do that at the end of this, feel free to message me uh, and I'll help out exactly where I can. RMR, measured in a very similar way to BMR. The only difference is it accounts for the oxygen consumption of the body, allows for small amounts of movement, different environments and digestion, usually no more than about 10% of BMR. Thermic effect of food. Thermogenesis sounds super fancy, but it's essentially, it essentially just means the production of heat. Digestion, absorption, and assimilation of ingested food nutrients is an active process, meaning that it takes energy. How much metabolic activity goes up depends on which macronutrients we eat. Proteins tend to have the highest thermic effect response as it takes the body more energy to process them, while fats tend to have the lowest thermic response. Uh, for example, meat sweats. Thermic effect of food is usually around 10% of total daily energy expended. It can be affected by other factors like insulin resistance, which lowers TEF. So meat sweats right here. What I mean by that, if you've ever finished a giant steak by yourself, you've gotten really hot and sweaty. It's because your body is trying to break up everything that is there and it has a high thermic effect of food. So it needs to produce more heat, which means when you finish that giant steak, there's a hell of a lot of protein in it. You're going to be sweating bowls. Um, so if you've ever heard the term, it takes money to make money, very similar in the body. It takes energy to make energy. Exercise activity. The energy used to perform purposeful exercise. For sedentary people, people that work a desk job and just aren't very active, this can make up around 10 to 15% or less of their daily energy demands. For active people, this can make up around 30%, if not more, of their, of their daily energy demands. Higher intensity activity not only creates a demand during the activity, it also creates a demand after the activity. For example, resistance training, strength training, lifting heavy shit. This increase in exercise post-oxygen consumption, EPOC, helps make up the energy deficit created during the activity itself, which increases your metabolism. So your exercise activity is basically things that you've planned for. So if you have an Apple Watch or whatever, you'll see like active calories where you turn it on to go for a walk or an exercise or a hike or anything like that. Go to the gym, that's exercise activity. I make that case or I just pick up that differentiating factor because NEAT is non-purposeful. Non-exercise activity thermogenesis. This is all daily life movements that aren't deliberate, such as moving around the home or workplace, fidgeting, pacing, tapping your feet, work, workhouse, housework or yard work, playing with kids or pets, carrying groceries. And for most people with sedentary jobs, NEAT contributes the least to daily energy expenditure. But it is an important part of weight loss or gains. This is why the 10K Step Count Initiative was such a big push by governments 
or the Australian government at least, to increase general population NEAT levels. This is where a lot of people could do better in their random exercise through the day. A lot of studies have come out and shown that the reason people yo-yoed is because their diets or yo-yo with their diets is because they inherently have a low NEAT level. So when they finish a challenge, they immediately go back to what they were doing beforehand, which is incredibly low physical activity, and then going back to eating whatever they were eating before the challenge. And then they've lowered their metabolism through the challenge because they've lost fat tissue, muscle tissue, and all of that fun stuff. And they end up putting on more weight and then some because the metabolism has to now catch up to everything that they have just put themselves through. And they haven't adjusted for anything. Total daily energy expenditure. All five processes that we just spoke about are a part of your metabolism. BMR, RMR, TEF, EA, NEAT, equal TDEE, total daily energy expenditure. All of those five processes get added together and spit out a single number. That's your TDEE, which is also your rough maintenance calories. Man, I just looked at myself on the camera. I am albino with that sun absolutely beaming in, but we're rolling with it. We're going with it. So your TDEE is how much energy you use every single day, taking into account all of those five factors. This is why your metabolism changes every single day. Someday you'll get more steps in than others. Someday you'll go to the gym. Some days you won't. And your metabolism fluctuates and changes on a daily basis. That's why if, you're ever, if you've ever heard anyone talk about maintenance calories, they're like, oh, my maintenance calories are 1900. It's usually about 10% one way or the other, 15% one way or the other. So if you're at a maintenance phase, for example, myself, around about 87 kilos is where I sort of sit flush. Uh, I'll typically fluctuate between like 87.5 and 86.5, usually within a kilo of that, because my metabolism changes every day. I eat different foods every day, and it's just not going to be the exact same every single day. So that's why you'll fluctuate a little bit. These are all approximations. These are not 100%. You are this number. It's all a guessing game. What are macros and why do they matter? Macro means macronutrient. A macronutrient is one of three major nutrients that hold a caloric value and are required in large amounts in the diet. They are called macronutrient because they are the largest and most important nutrients that we need. So at the bottom here, these are all per gram. So for one gram of protein, there is four calories. One gram of carb, there is also four calories. One gram of fat, there are nine calories. And one gram of alcohol is seven calories. There's an asterisk to it because alcohol is not a macronutrient but it is associated with a caloric value as we've figured out probably a few years ago. I can't remember exactly when, but alcohol does have calories in it. So that's why I always have to make that assumption there. Uh, cal wow, alcohol does have a fair amount of calories involved with it. So what's a macro? Protein. These are the building blocks of every single cell within your body. There are approximately 37.2 trillion cells in the body and every single one of them contains a form of protein. Carbs, the body's preferred fuel source. The body does everything in its power to make sure that everything we consume is turned into glucose, which is then turned into or stored as glycogen, broken down carbs. So we can function. I know I've said that wrong there, but I've realized that it doesn't get turned into glycogen. It gets turned into glucose, which then gets stored as glycogen. Uh, so we can function and use it for brain activity. Fats. Certain fats are needed in the diet because the body can't produce them itself. They help absorb other nutrients and are needed for a healthy immune system. So protein, when it gets broken down, it gets broken down into something called amino acids, which, which are then transported to the liver and then transported around the body and kept for building connective tissue, muscle proteins, neurotransmitters, enzymes, immune system chemicals, transport proteins, absolutely fucking everything in your body. Um, the brain cannot use for carbs, whoop, for carbs. The brain cannot use any other fuel source except for glycogen. Uh, it uses on average at least 130 grams of glycogen per day. It accounts for about 25 to 30% of your total daily energy expenditure. Um, and I could go on a whole thing about how keto doesn't exactly work there. I'm just going to leave it. If you have mess, if you have anything about keto and how that works in terms of like the blood brain barrier and everything like that, let me know. Um, there are some fun studies coming out about keto and ketones and their effect on neurodegenerative diseases in the brain, since they can only get transported through the blood brain barrier via the MTC one transport carrier. I believe I might be wrong on that one. Uh, but, carbs, 
Super simple. Brain needs them. Easiest way I can say it. So carbs. Carbohydrates are the body and brain's preferred fuel source, though the body will adapt to whatever fuel we give it, i.e. keto or fasting. That's why people go like, I am a fat burning machine on keto. It's like, yes, if I fill up my car with just diesel, it's going to burn just diesel or it's going to burn more diesel as opposed to if I put a normal petrol in my car, like premium unleaded, it's going to burn premium unleaded. So when people say they're in fat burning mode or they're burning more fats, it's just because they're providing their body more fats to burn. If I throw more, more wood onto a fire and I go, wow, that fire is in wood burning mode. It's an oversimplification of a very simple mechanism. You, you, the body will burn what you give it. It's nothing magical. Carbohydrates break down into glucose and glucose is 100% necessary for energy transport through the body. Fiber is technically a carbohydrate and it is very important for gut health and a healthy lifestyle. Simple carbs are just short chain carbohydrates. So they are broken down much easier and can be used for energy quicker. For example, lollies or anything with sugar in it. Complex carbs are long chain carbohydrates and they take longer to break down during digestion. So you have more sustained energy. That's why most people prefer going for, or most health professionals prefer low GI foods. So you get a sustained release of energy instead of sugar rush and then crash and then sugar rush and then crash. Uh, fats, good and bad. You've probably heard about the good fats and bad fats before. So let's just focus on them for today and keep it super simple. There are three major classifications of fat, very low density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins and high density lipoproteins. They've got their little abbreviations right there. HDL or high density lipoproteins uh, brings fat and cholesterol from the body's cells back to the liver. This is an important process known as reverse cholesterol transport. This is why HDL is considered the heart healthy fat because of the above process. So very low density and low density, let's just run through them. VLDL carries newly created and packaged triglycerides, fat, uh, from the liver to adipose tissue. So it takes it from the liver and puts it somewhere on the body. LDL carries cholesterol to all cells in the body. They basically just deposit cholesterol into our arteries. Uh, dietary fat plays six roles for us. But before we do that, that's why high density lipoproteins are super important because the very low and the low density ones essentially take it to the body and the fat and the arteries and everything like that. And then the high density goes, no, 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 we're having none of that and brings it back from all of those things into the liver so that it can be broken down. That, that's why reverse cholesterol transport is awesome. Uh, so the six roles that they play, they provide energy. One gram equals nine calories. It is the most energy dense macronutrient on the planet. Uh, helps make and balance hormones, form our cell membranes, forms our brain and nervous systems, help transport fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, provides two fatty acids we can't make, omega-3 and six fatty acids, which is why when people come to me and they have mental health issues, I particularly say, get on the fats, particularly omega-3 and six, because uh, they are amazing for the work that they do with the brain. Uh, protein summarize, growth and maintenance, one gram of protein is four calories. It helps cause biochemical reactions. It aids communication between your cells, tissues, and organs. It helps form immunoglobulins or antibodies to fight infection and carry substances throughout your bloodstream into cells, out of cells, or within cells. As I mentioned earlier, protein gets broken down into amino acids and taken to the liver. Whatever the liver doesn't use goes into a plasma amino acid pool in our body. The body's cells can then extract amino acids from the plasma pool for various tasks, such as synthesizing or just creating, trying to sound smarter than I actually am, uh, just creating muscle proteins, uh, skeletal and connective tissues, neurotransmitters, enzymes, immune system, chemicals, transport proteins. Almost every single client that I have that signs up is under eating protein by like fivefold, at least hundred grams of protein is for most people what I say, depends on the individual of course, but you need to be getting protein for the amount of role that it plays in your body, not just for building muscle, absolutely in everything. Weekend dieting. Whenever I'm the first on the phone with someone and I ask how their nutrition is, it usually sounds like, yeah, good. I'm on about 1500 calories per day at the moment. And I just don't know where the weight is coming from. Like. 
I eat pretty healthy. Obviously on the weekend, I'll have a wine or two, but that's about it. And the deeper I end up digging into their 1500 calorie, the more I realize they're most likely on 1200 calories Monday through Friday, and then 3000 calories on the weekends. So it's not uncommon either. This is the most typical thing that a lot of my clients do when they initially come on board. So you, if this is you, this is, a, this is 90% of the clients that I take on board. So you are not alone. It is beyond common. Eating very low during the week, getting tired, brain fog, lethargic, no motivation because they have zero fuel in their body. And they wonder why they don't have any energy because they're not providing their brain or body any energy to begin with. Then it gets to the weekend and they've already mentally given up from almost starving themselves. So of course, they're going to have a binge cycle. So I'll show you some quick numbers. Weekend dieting. Let's say your maintenance calories are 1800 calories. So you go into a diet and decide to eat 1400 calories in order to lose weight. 1800 calories by seven days in the week equals 12,600 calories per week in order to not lose or gain. So that's your maintenance right there. But your diet has you on 1400 calories for seven days, 900, sorry, 9,800 calories in the week, which will put you in a weekly calorie deficit of around 2800 calories, which will lean to it lead to around about 300 grams of fat loss per week, maybe 400 grams. Now those are basic numbers. So let's look at how the weekend completely fucks with that. Weekend dieting. Monday through Friday, you do really well and stick to your 1400 cal. So you've got 1400 calories for five days, 7,000 calories. Let's say you're tired and burnt out from the week and decide to let go a bit and decide to have a pizza, a few drinks on Saturday night, catch up with a friend at a cafe and treat yourself. So Saturday and Sunday have gone to approximately 3,000 calories each. 7,000 plus 6,000 is 13,000, which is 400 calories more than your weekly maintenance calories of 12,6. And the 3,000 calories that I've approximated there is easily done, very easily done. This is a conservative guess. This is why a lot of people lose weight Monday through Friday, weigh in on Saturday morning, and they are super pleased with their results. Then they weigh in on the Monday morning and wonder why they've put on a kilo because they've just consumed five days worth of calories across the weekend. And the scary thing, oh, I said it right here. The scary thing about this is the 3000 cal number I gave out as well is the conservative number. I'm not discouraging going and living your life. I'm actually encouraging you to look at your life as a whole instead of a weekday versus weekend lifestyle. And if you've been following me for a while or you know anything about my business, I'm 100% going to tell you to go out on the weekend and do whatever it is that you need to be doing with your social life. I'm just going to tell you to, if you are looking at your health for whatever reason, I'm just going to tell you to not act like a fucking child and you'll be pretty sweet. How yo-yo diets work and how to avoid them. Diet cycling or yo-yo dieting is where you'll go hard for six to eight weeks, lose a bunch of weight and put it all back on and then some. Well, it's not because of the mythical starvation mode or anything like that. It's simply because your metabolism, which is an ever moving number, as we've just figured out, has been lowered during intense exercise and restrictive eating because you've lost fat tissue and muscle tissue. And now your metabolism has decreased. Exercise like mad and eat very low calories for six to eight weeks. Your metabolism will begin to lower to adapt to the stimulus that you provide it. So your metabolism may have been 1600 calories, meaning that you burn that many calories per day. Uh, then you decrease your overall weight, maybe build a little bit of muscle, but because you're not eating enough to build and repair, your metabolism does decrease. You do end up losing those muscle tissues. So after that six to eight weeks, your body starts to adapt to your new normal, uh, the stimulus that you're providing it, the food and the workouts. Then you stop exercising, go back to your old habits. And because your metabolism isn't as high as it was before starting, you'll put on weight while your metabolism goes up to only a percentage of what it was. So when you started the challenge, you may have burnt 1600 calories per day. End of the challenge, your metabolism may have dipped to 1400 calories. And now that you're back doing what you were doing beforehand, it'll take longer for your metabolism to raise than it will to decrease it. So during that time of losing weight, if you don't address your habits, behaviors, thought patterns, or learn anything from the challenge that you'll take with you for the rest of your life, you'll essentially, you've essentially just said, hi, uh, I'd like a Band-Aid solution to my mental anguish surrounding my self-worth. Thanks. And then you've gone on for six to eight weeks and you've ended up in a worse position than you are because you've accepted another Band-Aid fix for a lifelong problem. So this is how you avoid them. 
Whenever you start a new challenge, most people have the mindset of, I'm going to lose a kilo a week, which is usually unsustainable. Almost every challenge people do is high intensity interval training workouts and crazy 1200 calorie meal plans. No one ever really goes into a challenge asking how they got to where they are and needing a change in the first place. Everyone just wants to lose weight and cover up something they're not dealing with, which is usually some sort of emotional eating or, oh, here we go. It's at the, <laughs> I really need to look at what I'm doing. For example, emotional binge eating, anxiety, low self-confidence, identifying as someone who's destined to be overweight, etc. There are so many reasons as to why someone has done that. The best way to avoid a yo-yo diet is to stop looking for the quick and cheap, easy band-aid fix. I had a client once who came to me and across six years, she'd spent about $9,000 on challenges and somehow ended up 20 kilos heavier than when she started her health journey because obviously she got sucked into the yo-yo dieting, which is no one's fault. It's exactly the fitness industry that is marketing that to everyone. And I feel sorry for everyone that is coming into it and doesn't know how to go into behavior change habits and all that shit. Obviously the industry is, you want to lose weight? I'll help you lose weight. Whereas this is exactly why I created the program that I have created is if you want to lose weight, I'll help you lose weight, but I'm also going to make sure that you never have to worry about going through another challenge ever again. That's why I charge what I charge is because it fucking puts me out of business. Um, whereas if that client had just said, if I'd have just learned to calm the fuck down and make it a happy lifestyle, I would have saved so much money. And she actually said that. She said, if I'd have just learned to calm the fuck down and make a lifelong change, I would have saved so much money. And I suppose that's why I made my program because if you do it once, that's it. You are done. You learn about nutrition. You learn about your mindset. You learn about what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And you don't have to worry about getting sucked into the fucking yo-yo diet culture that there is. So um, if you're keen to learn more on that, message me. Instagram at The Fitness Genie. You probably got this link from the Instagram anyway. Um, there is going to be a free mindset training video similar to this one, but based around more of the tips I give to my premium transformation clients. Or if you just want to straight up book in a coaching call with me and get individual advice, uh, either message me on Instagram or visit the coaching call booking link in my bio. If the booking link is not there, just message me on Instagram. I love having a chat with people and helping them for free um, if I've got the time to do it. So I hope that helped in some regard. Keep your eyes out for part two. That is going to be all about mindset, but I hope that helped get away from some of the bullshit that is out there in the fitness industry. If you need anything, message me. Have the best day.